So for this morning, I want to zoom in on one specific aspect of God speaking to us. God can speak to you in a lot of ways. He even used a donkey once, right? Which skeptics look at that and they're like, oh, the Bible has fairy tales. Look at donkey speaks. But look, if there's a God who's capable of creating a universe, he can, make a, he can use a donkey like a puppet, okay? I mean, it's just not that hard for a God like that. But anyhow, God can speak through lots of different ways, through prayer, through circumstances, through other people in your life. But this morning, I want to look at how God speaks through Scripture. And I want to begin by really just talking to you about the Bible. How many of you brought your Bible this morning? Anybody bring their Bible? Let's, let's see what... Whoa! Somebody put a water cup on my Bible. It's probably me. Hold up your Bible. Let's see what you're packing. All right, we've got a couple of digitals, big ones, small ones, a tablet over there. My Bible has been baptized, so it's special. <laughs> I love the Bible. The Bible is so cool. I mean, how many other 1,000 plus page books do you spend time with, right? I mean, I was looking at all the Bibles in my office, and the shortest one I have is 1,000 pages long. That's the shortest one. And, then, and, that, and that's the one with the small print. And then the longest one I have is 1,600 pages long. Same Bible, it's just a little easier to read. And that's just something, isn't it? How the Bible is such a long book. If you, if you look at another long book, Moby Dick, some of you probably were forced to read that, Herman Melville, that's three and a half Moby Dicks, one Bible. And the Bible is not even a book. It's a library. It's a collection of books. The Bible has in it 66 books. And it's not written by one person. It's written by over 35 different people. And it's not written in one year. Or, I mean, think about a book that takes a long time to write. Maybe there are some books that somebody started on it when they were young, and they finished it just before they were to die. And let's say it took them 50 years to write a book. Right? That's nothing compared to the Bible. The Bible took over a thousand years to write. I mean, it's just so weird if you think about it. I mean, it's, it's, it's not a book, it's a library, and it's something that was, was written by all these different individuals over centuries, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. In fact, something like 1,500 years for us to get the scriptures as we have them today. And it's the most translated book in the world. You have Harry Potter translated into 80 languages. Alice's Adventures in Wonderland has 174 different languages that it's translated into. Pinocchio, 260. And then this book I never heard of, The Little Prince, some sort of like French kids book or something. 300 languages really tops the, uh, the list until you look at the Bible, which is well over 500 different languages. The entire Bible is the most translated book on earth, 554 languages. And every time I look up that stat, it changes higher than it was the last time I looked at it. Isn't that something? I mean, the Bible is, is still getting translated into new languages all the time. In fact, it's by far the best-selling book. It's so, it so far outstrips the competition that Wikipedia won't include it in the list of best-selling books. It won't because it, it, it's embarrassing compared to the others. Right? The others sell, like, what, millions of copies? You have a book that sells millions of copies. You're like, oh, wow. Talk about a New York Times bestseller, right? Or maybe 100 million copies. I mean, if you write a book, Bradley, and it sold 100 million copies, I mean, you're set for life. 100 million copies. What about 200, 300 million copies? What if you, what if you sold a billion copies of a book, right? And yet the Bible is somewhere, and they don't, nobody even knows because like, there are so many copies of the Bible for so many centuries, right, that is before the printing press even. Somewhere in the neighborhood of 5 billion copies sold in all these different languages over all these centuries in all the world. So even if you don't believe in the Bible, and I realize that most of you do, I hope you believe in the Bible, but you know, we have friends that don't. We have, we have co-workers that are skeptical. And you know, the Bible is always under attack. So I hope to just maybe encourage you a little bit this morning that God actually speaks through Scripture first of all, and then look at ways we can engage with that in a minute here. So let's go over to Acts chapter 1. I want to give you, in fact, 10 reasons that I know that God has inspired the Scriptures. 
And the first is that the Bible itself claims that God inspired it. And I know you're, what you're thinking. You're like, well, that's circular, Sean. How do you know the Bible's inspired? Well, the Bible claims it's inspired. Well, how do you know that's true? Well, the Bible says it. I mean, you're just going around in a circle. But until you, until you start to think about one question, which is, how many other books do you have that claim to be inspired by God? That's not a normal thing, right? Like, when you're reading books in college or you have to, have to read in uh, high school, whatever kind of, like, classics they forced upon you, how many of them opened with, you know, or had in, in somewhere in there a declaration that this was, this was written by a prophet who was moved along by the Holy Spirit? It's just a very strange thing, just even to this day. I mean, there are only a few books that even make those sorts of claims. So I think this is important to start with. And we read in Acts chapter 1, verse 16, just looking at how the Bible refers to itself. Brothers, the Scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. Look at how the Bible talks about the Bible. So this is Acts chapter 1 talking about the Scriptures, the Old Testament Scriptures. And what it says is that the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David. So when the Bible is referring to itself, the New Testament is referring to the Old Testament, it's saying what we had there was not David's opinion. What we had there was not just David being poetic. But, I mean, he was being poetic. I mean, it's the Psalms, right? But what we have there is the Holy Spirit speaking through David. The next one I want to look at is Acts 3.18. Just flip over a couple of chapters and take a look at this. Acts 3.18, But what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets that His Christ would suffer, He thus fulfilled. So once again, God foretold by the mouth of the prophets. So yes, the prophets are involved, but it's really God speaking by the mouth of the prophets. And then one more, Acts 4.24, we see this. I mean, there, there are a lot, I give you lots of references in your notes so that you would have them. I'm not going to all those verses. But that's how the Bible normally talks about itself. Acts 4.24, And when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, so this is a prayer, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said, By the Holy Spirit... Why did the Gentiles rage? So in the first reference we looked at Acts 1.16, it says that the, the Scriptures, the Old Testament Scriptures are through the Holy Spirit, right? By the mouth of David through the Holy Spirit. The second one says God spoke through the prophets. And the third one here says both. God spoke through the prophets by the Holy Spirit, right? So you, you get the idea that e even in the time of the first century when these books were, were starting to be written, the whole uh, majority of the Bible that was already written, which we call the Old Testament, they looked at that as inspired Scripture. And by inspired, we mean that God was speaking through it. God was involved in the process of that. And then we come to a major verse here, 2 Timothy 3.16, I have up on the screen. All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. I mean, this, this phrase right here, breathed out by God, that is an excellent translation. This word is usually translated inspired by God, but it's actually the literal words, God breathed. And so it's not, it's, it's a big claim, right? I mean, it's saying that all Scripture is breathed out by God. And it's useful for these different purposes, teaching, reproof, and correction, so that you can be trained in righteousness. And then the next one, let's, let's flip over to this, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 16, just to round out reason number one here about how we know the, God has inspired the Scriptures. And uh, in 2 Peter, we, we get this little part where the Apostle Peter is talking about his own experience with Jesus. I mean, what would that have been like? I mean, different people write different things, and they say different things, but like Peter was there, right? And half the time, Peter was kind of like embarrassing himself. And then the other half of the time, he's like, I believe, and he's running ahead at full speed, right? So in 2 Peter 1.16, we read, 
For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of His majesty. So what Peter says Peter did and was doing is not making up stories, not being clever like Aesop's fables, but he is an eyewitness of His majesty, and we're, we're not making stuff up here. I was there, people. That's what Peter's saying here. Look at the next verse. Verse 17, For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased, we ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven. For we, are, we were with him on the holy mountain. He's talking about the mount of what? Transfiguration. Where Peter was there, and John, and James, and Jesus went up with them, and then suddenly he changed before them and he was glowing and it was weird and they all were totally undone and they're like let's make some tents for you guys <laughs> and then they heard the voice from heaven and it, and it said this is my beloved son in whom i am well pleased peter's like look i was there this is decades later he's referring back to this he's like i was there i heard the voice and then we see in verse 19 and we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So Peter says, look, the Scripture is even more solid than when I was there. And I was there. So don't tell me I wasn't there, because I know I was there. I know what I saw. I know what I heard. And yet, we have even more confidence in the prophetic word, because they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So that's just a little bit about the inspiration of Scripture. But the next uh, few reasons here I gave is what I would call the fingerprints of God. You know, like a crime scene. If you find somebody's fingerprints, you're like, oh, Patty was there. She committed the crime. Just kidding. Patty didn't commit crime. But uh, we, know, we know somebody's there because they find the fingerprints, right? And so the Bible has fingerprints of God on it. And one of those is predictive prophecy. There are a number of prophecies in the Bible that talk about events that happen later on, like after the person's lifetime. I'll just give you one example. Jeremiah. Jeremiah was a prophet in a very difficult time. He prophesied against popular opinion. And he suffered greatly for this prophecy that his people, his country, would be no more for 70 years. And then they would return. And that's a, that's a doubly unlikely prophecy. One, countries don't go out of existence all that often. I mean, it's, it's very rare that it happens. I mean, it does happen, but it's not, it's not normal, right? To just like have all the people evacuated from the country, right? That's strange. And it's interesting, too, because there were other prophets that were prophesying the opposite against Jeremiah. And they were saying, oh, it's going to be three years. We're going to be, everything's going to be fine. We can stay. And Jeremiah's like, no, we're not going to stay. We're, we're getting kicked out. The landlord is kicking us out. And we were out for 70 years, and then we're coming back. And you know what? Well after Jeremiah was dead, there was another prophet, Daniel. And he's reading the book of Jeremiah. You can read about it in Daniel chapter 9. And he says, these years are almost up. And he starts praying. And he's like, wow, it's almost 70 years. We're going back. We're going back. And then that's exactly what happened. I, I tell you, I was sitting in a, a skeptical environment with a bunch of people that didn't believe in the inspiration of Scripture. And they're just like, we don't know what to do with this 70 years thing. It's really, it's really a, a conundrum. Because we know there's no God, and we know that He doesn't inspire, and there's no such thing as miracles. And predicting the future is like really difficult. Just ask the weatherman or the stock market investors. I mean, it's really hard to predict the future. And so how did he possibly get this right? It's just the fingerprints of God on the book. Number three, unflattering honesty. Look, if you're going to make up a book, you're going to make yourself look good. Right? You're not going to, you're not going to record. Like, if, if Abraham's making up the part about Genesis, would he include the two times, not just once, twice, that he deceived people into thinking that Sarah was not his wife but just his sister? I mean, that's entirely... That's embarrassing, right? Or what about the uh, number of other instances? Can you, can you think of any off the top of your head? Noah gets through the flood. All of humanity has been wiped out. And what does he do? He gets drunk. 
It's like the, the beginning of new humanity. Hey, guys. <laughs> right? I mean, it's just ridiculous. I mean, why would you put that in there if you, were, if you were making it up? Or what about David, the great king, the prototype of the Messiah? And what does he do? Adultery, murder, deception. I mean, he almost, he, and if he did it on the Sabbath, he could have broken all Ten Commandments on one day. <laughs> this guy. And yet, and yet, Jesus is called, in the Scriptures, the Son of David. I mean, why put all that stuff in there? Or in the New Testament, Peter denies Christ. I don't know Him. That's something for a start of Christianity. You know, in, in other words, unless it actually happened, why would we have all these unflattering, uh, honest parts of it? And then we have health insight. I don't have time to look at this with you, but if you read the book of Leviticus, the book of Numbers, the book of Deuteronomy, probably three of the lesser read books in the Bible, you will come across all these amazing health insights that there's no way they could have figured out on their own. You know, it's just like too advanced for their time. For example, the whole idea that life is in the blood. They didn't know about red blood cells. They didn't know about oxygen. Just like had this like, and what, what I liken this to is God's social engineering. So you have a, a pre-modern society of like over a million people, and you want them to be healthy and not die of preventable diseases. So what do you do? You outlaw things. I mean, there's no explanation given, but there's just like certain things outlawed. Like if you touch a dead body, you have to go through a seven-day cleansing ritual, ritual involving washing yourself with water. That's, that's weird, that's inconvenient, but you know what? It prevents the spread of disease. Or circumcision on the eighth day. It turns out that the eighth day is the best day in your whole life to do surgery because the blood clotting me me uh, mechanism is at its peak on that one day and it will never be that high again the rest of your life. And it's really low the days before that and then it comes back down to normal right after that. I mean, do you think Abraham experimented that there were like 70 other Isaacs before the one we know? And it's like, all right, try day one. Oh, that didn't work. Try day two. And then like they landed on the... Nobody experiments on their infant's surgery. You know what I mean? And so where do they get this from? They got it from God. We, we have lots of these. Uh, the food laws. A lot of the animals that they were not allowed to eat were animals that in their society and at their time, their state of technology, would be carriers for lots of diseases. Um, I don't have time to go into that with you, but you can check that out. You can just Google none of these diseases on, on the Internet, and you can find uh, lots of stuff about that. All right, so number five, martyrdom. Why would you die if you knew it was a lie? I mean, think about the prophets in the Bible. Those of you who have read through big parts of the Bible and read the prophets. The prophets are not generally people that are popular and well-liked. The prophets are kind of weird. And they're, they're these, these men, and they're prophetesses too, men and women who have been touched by God and who are giving the people God's perspective on what they're doing, which is usually repent because of your sin, right? I mean, you've read the prophets. There are a lot of woes in the prophets and, and the wrath of God, the day of the Lord. Repent so that, you know, you can be forgiven and, and, and all this. So the, the prophets... They're predicting the future. They're, they're, predict, they're speaking to the people. If they are just making it up, what's their motive? Or you think about the apostles. If the apostles just made up the different stories about Jesus that we read about in the Gospels, what do they get out of it? Do they get uh, money? No, they were dirt poor. Do they get fame? Not in their lifetimes. Do they get power? Do they get to rise up and become a powerful organization? There is no institutional Christianity for centuries. I mean, the first century followers of Jesus who wrote these things down about him were persecuted. They were marginalized. They were rejected by their families. They were rejected by the leadership in Jerusalem. They were persecuted by the Roman government. There is no motive for these people to make these things up. And let me tell you something else. About the moment they're going to execute you, you say, just kidding, if you knew it was just made up, right? Like, if you're going to die for Jesus being raised from the dead, at, the, at what point do you say, all right, okay, oh, you got me. 
It was Peter's idea, but I just went along with it. I mean, at, at what point? When they arrest you, when they start whipping you, or when, when you're hanging on the cross upside down like Peter? I mean, what point do you give up? Unless you are sincerely believing that it's true. And look, if you and I sincerely believe it's true, that's one thing. They were there. They knew if it was true or not. They saw him after he was raised from the dead. So I think martyrdom is another reason. And then we have archaeology. Archaeology is so fun. So I'm going to show you some slides about that. Would that be all right with you? All right. I, I just picked like some of the highlights. I've got lots of slides about archaeology. But the, once again, these are just the fingerprints of God. Look, if there was an Israel, if there was a King David, if there was a Pontius Pilate, if there were these people read, read about in the Bible, they would have left a trail in history, right? So here is the obelisk of Shalmaneser III, something that we all know about, right? Just kidding. Totally obscure. Ninth century B.C., this is an Assyrian inscription. So this is not part of the, the people of the Bible. It's not part of Israel. This is Assyria, and it mentions Jehu, the king of Israel. How about this one? The Tel Dan Steel. This is from the ninth century B.C. as well, and it's the earliest archaeological mention of the house of David. Scholars had questioned the existence of David. They were like, oh, these Israelites, they needed a myth for the founding of their kingdom. So they just came up with this David story, David and Goliath, yada, yada, yada. And then later on, they found this, and they're like, oh, I guess there was a David. Then we have Sennacherib's prism, which is a 7th century Assyrian inscription mentioning Hezekiah, the king of Judah, talking from, a, once again, an Assyrian, that's the enemies of Israel. It's from an enemy perspective. It's a hostile witness. Then we have the Babylonian Chronicles from the 6th century, and they mention Belshazzar, the, Bel, the very Belshazzar mentioned in the book of Daniel. Then we have the Cyrus Cylinder from the 6th century. This is a Persian inscription that talks about how Cyrus sent all the peoples back to their lands. And this is recorded in the Bible in the book of Ezra. Then we have royal seals. This, this is like little bits of clay. They didn't really use wax much, but they used clay, and they would seal something uh, like a scroll. And we have seals from Ahaz, Manasseh, Hezekiah, and one that's not pictured on here, which I love, is the seal of Baruch, who is a totally obscure person. But he was Jeremiah's scribe. And, it, and you know how in the Bible, like, it'll say, like, somebody's name and then who their parents are? And you're, and, and you're always like, okay, who cares? It's too hard to pronounce. Just go to the next verse. If you're anything like me, right? The, the, the detail about Baruch is, like, the, the, the parents he's from, it matches exactly with this little piece of clay they found. Baruch, son of whoever, the scribe. Right? And it's just, it's just sitting there in the dirt somewhere on the planet until some archaeologist digs it up, and they hear a little clink with their shovel, and they're like, oh, look at that. You know, they find stuff all the time. Here's another one. This is the Pontius Pilate inscription. This is a, a, a recreation of it here. It actually looks like this. So they, but the, the part that, ironically, the part that survives is a part that says Pontius Pilate on it. <laughs> so they, they've reconstructed it, and it reads as follows. For the Caesareans, the Tiberium, which Pontius Pilate, the prefect of Judea, gave and dedicated. So they, again, scholars had questioned, was there a historical Pilate, or is this just made up by the Christians? And then they were digging around, and they found this stone tablet inscription, and they're like, well, I guess there was a Pontius Pilate after all. And we know lots about Pilate from other writings outside of the Bible as well. And then this one, you might not have seen before, this is Yehochanan, the uh, son of Hagakal, and this is an ossuary on the right here, which is a bone box. The Israelite practice during the first century was to bury somebody in a cave, wait until their body decomposed about a year later, recollect the bones, and put them in a box, a limestone box. And they did that because then you could fit multiple family members in the same tomb, and you would just like write on the side whose box it was. Sort of, sort of like a coffin, but more of a permanent kind of uh, situation. So this is Yehochanan, and what's crazy about him is that, well, let me read what it says here. This ossuary was found in 1968 when building contractors working in the northeast Jerusalem accidentally uncovered a Jewish tomb containing the remains of a crucified man. So this guy has nothing to do with Christianity at all, but he was crucified, 
And it tells us two things. One, that crucified people could be buried in an honorable place as opposed to thrown in a common grave, which this is an honorable burial. And two, that they actually used nails because a lot of people had questioned that. They're like, the Romans would never use nails. The Gospels made that up. They would just use ropes. Well, when they were driving the nail through Yehochanan's leg, they hit a knot in the wood behind him, and the nail bent, as you can see here. So they couldn't get the nail out when they were taking him down. So it came, it's totally gross, I know, but it came with them, and that's the nail, <laughs> okay? That's the crucified nail. Then we have this one, another bone box. This is one of 12 ossuaries discovered in a burial cave in South Jerusalem in November 1990. This beautiful ossuary held the bones of a 60-year-old male. I don't know if you can see this on the side here, but it actually does have an inscription on it. And it reads, in a transliteration, is Yehosef bar Kaifa, which in English we would translate Joseph, son of Caiaphas. And this turns out to be the high priest who ordered the execution of Jesus. We have his ossuary to this day. And I know that in the New Testament he's just referred to as Caiaphas, but in other literature the same person is referred to Joseph, the son of Caiaphas. So they just call him Caiaphas for short. But this is his ossuary. There was a high priest named Caiaphas. We've got his burial box in a museum somewhere in the world. Um, and then this one. I love this one. This is, uh, this, uh, uh, okay, so this guy's the high priest. Look at his burial. Very ornate, very beautiful, right? And this is just a normal person. You can see the limestone is weathered. And uh, this is Oded Golan announced the existence of this ossuary on October 21st, 2002 at a conference co-hosted by the Discovery Channel and the Biblical Archaeology Society. And it's like, probably impossible for you to see this, much less read it, especially because you don't read ancient Aramaic. But uh, right here, there is an inscription on this ossuary that tells you who it is. And this is a, a super close-up of that inscription. And it reads, Yaakov bar Yosef Akui de Yeshua, which translates, James, the son of Joseph, brother of Jesus. They found his bone box. Now, there are lots of Jameses, Josephs, and Jesuses in the first century. But this is a triple hit. You know what I mean? You got all three right there. Second of all, ossuaries don't usually talk about who your brother is. Who cares who your brother is? We want to know who your father was, what your job was, or where you were from. What do they call Jesus? Jesus of Nazareth, of Nazareth right? Because Nazareth was a tiny village, so he was Jesus of Nazareth. If he was Jesus of Jerusalem, you wouldn't call him that because there's 50,000 Jesuses of Jerusalem. Well, probably not that many, but there are a lot of them, right? The only reason why you would call, you would identify your ossuary by the name of your brother is if that particular brother was famous for something. So we have a James who's the son of Jesus who has a famous brother named Jesus. Come on! It's pretty good. So that's archaeology. Just a, a few, I mean, there are lots of other archaeological discoveries. But look, if this thing really happened, it would leave a trail. And I'm saying to you, it really did happen, and we know that because it did leave a trail. Another one of the reasons is the earmarks of historicity. I, I love this verse. It's, it's one of these verses that we would just like read as fast as possible normally. But uh, this is Luke, the historian, who talked all about Jesus. And he writes, In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, and Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip, tetrarch of the region of Eteria and Trachonitis, and Licinius, tetrarch of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John the son of Zechariah in the wilderness. Does that read to you like a fairy tale? <laughs> I mean, when you don't have a universally agreed upon dating system, that's how you do it. You list everyone who's in charge of every realm of society. So he starts right at the top. Who's the emperor? When Jesus started his ministry, when John came on the scene, and then Jesus after him, it was Tiberius Caesar. So he lists that out. And we've got the year, the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar. And then, who's the local leader? Pontius Pilate. He's the governor. All right, well, who are the other regional leaders? He lists off all these tetrarchs. And then he's like, last of all, who are the religious leaders? Annas and Caiaphas, who are the high priests. This is the kind of, what I call, earmarks of historicity we find in the Bible. It's not, 
you know, it's, these people are saying that they're, what they're writing is what happened. And so I think it's, a, it's, a, it's another indication that it is what actually happened. And then I, I don't have any time to get into this, but the historicity of the resurrection. There are a number of agreed upon facts by non-believing scholars of the New Testament, atheists and skeptical scholars of the New Testament, that they accept themselves, using the Bible just as like a historical document. And based on those, we can build a very strong case for the resurrection, that Jesus actually was historically raised from the dead. And then um, last two, incredible preservation. I mean, just absolutely astounding how many manuscripts of, in particular, the New Testament have survived. I mean, when it comes to other ancient Greek works like Homer, we have 643 copies, Herodotus, eight copies, skipping down a little bit, Demosthenes, we have 200 copies of his writings. But when it comes to the New Testament, we have 5,794. I mean, it's just like, what? It's, it's embarrassingly good. And the New Testament comes from within a 250-year span from when it was originally written and when the pieces of paper that are in the museums around the world exist today. It's even better than that. There's actually a fragment of the New Testament that goes back to within 30 years of the writing. So these are all just different reasons to believe that God... And then changed lives. I mean, how many of us in this very room have a testimony of how our lives have been changed from reading the Bible, from encountering the Jesus that we find there, from reading about what God has done with us through Jesus Christ, right? I love the story of John Newton, a slave trader in the 1700s. He worked on the ship. He had no qualms about kidnapping Africans and, and, and sending them all around the world. And he even became a slave captain at one point. And then one night he had this weird experience where, well, I guess it's not that weird if you're in a ship in the 1700s. The ship started to sink. And there was a hole. And he cries out, he's like, God, save me. One of those prayers. And suddenly the cargo shifted and plugged a hole. So he, the ship was able to get to shore. And he's like, it's time to read this book. <laughs> it's time to read this book. And he started reading his Bible, John Newton. And he totally repented of his egregious sins. And he wrote that song that we call Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Once was blind, but now I see. That was John Newton. Through reading the Scripture, through encountering the God of the Scripture, he went from a slave trader captain to a totally repentant, humble man who eventually became a preacher in the Church of England. And he fought to eliminate slavery the rest of his life. And he saw it happen in England before he died. So that's a, an example of a change. We would have many more accounts that we could give of that. So what I'm saying to you is that when you read the Scripture, you, just beneath the surface, encounter the ins inspiration of God. The Holy Spirit is, is lurking beneath the surface of the words that you read. That as you read, the, like, even if God did nothing... From then till forever, you're still encountering Him when you read the Scriptures because He's inspired them. He, through the Spirit, he has, he has brought those words to be on that page. Okay, But it doesn't stop there because the Holy Spirit doesn't just lurk beneath the surface of the Scriptures. It hovers over the waters as well. The Spirit is, is working within you so that when you read the book, it's not just you. God can show you. He can illuminate your eyes so that you can understand what you read and be changed by it, even more importantly. How many times have you read a book, an article, and you weren't changed by it? You just read it because you had to read it or because it was interesting? I mean, the Bible is not just a book. It's something that has a living force behind it and above it and within you through what God is doing to change you. So I, I think it's just tremendous, tremendously exciting. I know like we, we look at our Bibles, we're like, oh yeah, that's the Bible, no big deal, it's been here. But it is a big deal. The Scriptures are a big deal. First of all, God's behind the Scriptures, and He's within you when you read the Scriptures. So I think we need, we need to take that seriously. Uh, before uh, going on much, I just want to say that when Jesus was about to leave, He said to His disciples that... When the Spirit comes, it will lead you into the truth. When the Spirit comes, it will remind you of what I have spoken. Okay, that's in John 14 and 15. 
how can you be reminded of something if you never read it in the first place? Right? I mean, they were there, but we weren't. So how are you going to know what Jesus said? We have to read the book. You know, we need to read, in particular, the teachings of Jesus so that when we're in the situations of life we find ourselves, the Spirit can do the reminding. <laughs> right? But if we don't do it in the first place, then I don't see how you can possibly be reminded. I mean, God is merciful, but hey, let's do the work. Old Testament... I want to just show you, like, engaging the Scripture. There are different parts of the Bible. It's a, it's a long book, right? So the Old Testament has three main sections in it. History, poetry, and prophecy. And when you read the Old Testament, you don't read all the sections just the same way. So, for example, if you're reading through the historical narratives, anywhere from Genesis all the way through to Esther, then what are you, what are you doing? You're looking at what God has done over time, and you're encountering examples, some of those examples are positive, like Abraham has faith, right? And then some of them are extremely negative, where somebody lies or somebody makes an oath and they have to kill their daughter. I mean, that's a very, don't do that, please. That's a negative example. It's an example of what not to do. So as you're reading through, you're, you're not just, you, you, it's not just discovery. It's not just like, oh, what happened next? I mean, yes, that's part of it. But then it's like, what can I learn from this? And when you're reading this part of the Old Testament, that's how, that's how to read it. And you can see God's just laws as well. Then we come to poetry, which is the middle section of the Old Testament, Job to the Song of Solomon. And there we, we find examples of prayers. I think that's tremendously helpful for us. A lot of times we don't know how to pray. You read some of those psalms when the wheels have fallen off, when life is in the toilet, they'll teach you how to pray when you're feeling that yourself. You read some of those psalms where... The grass is green, the birds are chirping, the sky is blue, and the, the wicked are punished, the righteous are rewarded. Hey, if that's the way your life is going right now, those are the kinds of psalms to engage with. Then you have other ones where God's just delivered you out of turmoil and your heart is full of gratitude. The psalms of reorientation. Th these, are, these are prayers for us to, to read. Um, then you have like books like Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, wisdom. We read the scriptures to get wisdom from God. Or to know what virtues are or how to deal with suffering. That's what the book of Job is about, right? Suffering. And then the Song of, so Song of Solomon, romance. Then the last part of the Old Testament is prophecy. Isaiah to Malachi. And that's an insider look at how God feels about his people's deeds as well as his future plans. So as you're reading, if you just flip open to a random place in the Bible, you might, you might have an issue. Okay, because you might, you might land somewhere where you're not, you, you don't know what's going on. But to recognize that there are different parts of the Bible and they work differently. They're all not going to be historical narrative, for example. There's a story about a guy who once opened the scriptures to Matthew 27.5. You know, he just like randomly opened. And he read the part that said, Judas went and hanged himself. You know, he's looking for a verse of the day. And he's like, huh. And then he flipped around a little bit and he just stuck his finger in. And he came to Luke 10, 37, where it says, go and do likewise. He's like, wow, I'm not having a good day. So he flipped around again and he's like, eh. And he got to John 13, 27, where it says, what you are going to do, do quickly. <laughs> that is the wrong way to read the Bible. You don't just flip around and like, I mean, yeah, maybe as a starting point, but that's, that's not... The best way to do it. The best way to do it is to engage with whatever section you're in and really come to understand it. Now, for the New Testament, we have these same uh, or similar kind of pattern. We have the history, which is like the Gospels and Acts that tells us about Jesus, his example, his teachings. Then we have the epistles, which is the whole middle section of the New Testament, Romans to 3 John. And that helps us to understand why Christ died, what it accomplished, how do we behave as a Christian. There's a lot of that in there. And then the last part, once again, just like the Old Testament, is a book of prophecy, which gives you an unveiling of heavenly realities, an assessment of the churches, encouragement. There's a lot in there. But what I'm saying to you is, depending on where you are in the Scriptures, it's helpful to know how that section works. Now, I want to uh, cover with you ever so briefly, five ways of reading Scripture. Because I, I bet you have one way of reading Scripture. Most of us have one way, and that's just how we do it. But there are actually multiple ways. 
So the most common way is to start somewhere, whether you start in Matthew in the beginning of the New Testament, or maybe you start in Genesis in the beginning of the whole Bible, and you're just going to read it through. And there are lots of Bible reading plans. And this, this is great, because this is the only way you're ever going to get a full scope of the Scriptures, is by reading all of the Scriptures, right? So if you want a scope of all the Scriptures, you have to read all the Scriptures. Uh, but after a while in your walk with the Lord, many of you have already read through the whole Bible multiple times. And so then the question becomes, well, what do I do now? Well, you can study a topic. And that's where you would be able to collect verses together on a topic to gain a full understanding on it. Or, number three here is go in depth on one book. Pick one book out of the Bible and say, this, I use the example here of Hebrews, this is the one book I'm going to focus on. And you read through the book of Hebrews, and, and, and you read it through a couple of times, and then you're like, all right, now that I've read it through, I'm going to slow it down. And I'm going to figure out what this chapter means. And you just go chapter by chapter, and you're really trying to understand it. Maybe you uh, go on the, the web and you look around at what other people have said about the book, or you buy a commentary, and you, you read along what it says there. And you really try to figure out what does, what does the whole thing mean? What do, what do each of the parts mean? How does it work? Right? And that's going in depth on one book. I, I highly recommend all of these. I'm not pitting them against each other. But I'm saying... What I'm saying is that if you're in a rut, try something different than what you normally do so that you can see how it works. And then there's meditation. This is great for the Psalms and Proverbs where you can read through Scripture and maybe instead of doing a whole psalm, do like half a psalm or maybe just a few verses. And you read it through and you read it through and you really chew on it and you uh, try to understand what it means and then... Ask God through prayer to show you how it should affect you. Is there anything He wants you to do in light of this section that you're focusing on? Uh, same thing with Proverbs. It's good to, to meditate on Proverbs. And then visualization. Visualization is where you put yourself into the scene. It's great for the gospel. Say, for example, the incident where Jesus was in a, in a crowd and He's on His way to heal Jairus' daughter. And then out of nowhere... This woman comes and touches the fringe of his garment, and he says to his disciples, "Who touched me?" And he's like, and the disciples are like, "Well, you see the crowd. I mean, who? Like everybody's touching you. What are you talking about?" And then he says, "Well, I felt power go out from me. You know, you know this one, right?" And uh, the woman comes forward and she said, "Oh, I was I had this hemorrhage of blood for all these years, and and now I'm healed." You know, and. You can read something like that just at the surface level and you get just the bare facts like I just said to you right now. Or you could really slow it down. Put yourself in the scene. Pretend like you're a cameraman or a woman. And what angles would you shoot? How would you see it? Close your eyes and like really picture it. Picture the crowd. Picture Jesus. Picture his disciples. Picture that woman. right? And then you bring on some other senses. What would it sound like? Well, it would probably be loud. Right? Because you have a crowd. Anytime you have a crowd and they're walking around, it's loud. And there are people talking. And then you think about, like, what, what did it sound like when Jesus talked? What, what was the woman? Did she have a quiver in her voice? You know, was she nervous? Was she confident? You know, what was that like? And, and you really just try to put yourself into the scene. And, and maybe you ask yourself the question, how would I feel if I was there? And I was experiencing this. And you really, and the idea is not to be creative and make stuff up, but to allow yourself to experience it in a deeper way than just reading it and then going to the next thing and then going to the next thing. And with both of these more meditative styles here, whether meditation or visualization, it's key that you do it prayerfully. If you want God to, do you want God to speak to you through the scriptures? Or you just want to read it like a textbook. You know what I mean? Like, do we believe that God inspired the Bible? If we believe that God inspired the Bible and that God can work within us to read it, then this should be exciting for us. You know, I mean, this is the God of the universe. And if He's right there in the Scriptures, and we're reading His book, you don't think He's going to want to help us? <laughs> you know, I mean, He preserved it all, over all these millennia. I mean, there were... There are whole empires that try to wipe the Scriptures out. And God preserved it through those times. And so here we are reading it, and it's like, 
we need, we need to be open and we need to maybe sometimes slow it down and ask the question through prayer and say, God, what do you have to show me this time? And then the second question, God, do you want me to do something? Do you want me to change something? I mean, if we don't ask, that's, you know, we're the ones that are missing out on it. So, I don't have any, any, any more time to do this with you, but I encourage you to check this out. I had this incredible experience, experience with J Jeremiah 17 once. I know, Jeremiah 17, right? That's not the quoted verse that is all over the internet. It's totally obscure. I was, I was in a fellowship and we were meditating on like five verses there and it talked about this person who doesn't trust in God and he's like this little bramble bush that doesn't ever have any fruit and then it talks about how the person who trusts in God is like a tree planted by waters and its leaves are green even when there's a drought and it produces its fruit in its season. And I was meditating on that, and I was dealing with a real situation in my life where I wasn't sure if I should, at 30 years old, go back to school with two kids and a wife and a mortgage, or if I should stay put where I was. And I really didn't know what to do. Some doors had opened up. I had received a scholarship, which I felt like was God. But I wasn't sure. And I couldn't know the future. I couldn't know if it would break my marriage. I couldn't know if it would ruin other parts of my life or other relationships, right? I couldn't know that. I had to, I had to get insight from God. And as I was reading and meditating on, the, on this scripture in Jeremiah 17 and praying, and I, and I asked God, show me what you want me to do. And I was, I was just like, in general, what do you want me to do? And he spoke to me and he said, I don't remember exactly what he said, but it was, go. You know, trust in me, be like the tree or you can stay here in the safety of your current life, like this little bush. I mean, it's a bush. It's better than nothing, right? But it doesn't have any fruit, and it's all dried out, and no, you know, nobody likes it. <laughs> or you could be like this tree planted by the living waters. And I was like, God, I'm scared, but I will go. I will go. You know, and he blessed our family during that time. And when we came back, we didn't have any money, but we weren't in debt either. We were like the day we were born, just like a baby. And let me tell you, if you get out of college and you're just like a baby, it's a victory! <laughs> I mean, and so that, that was just one experience I had where God spoke to me. But the only way that could happen is because I slowed it down, and I prayed, and I asked, and I waited. We have to wait sometimes and not, not be discouraged. But hey, try all these things because God is alive. He speaks through Scripture. He has spoken through Scripture. And He will continue to speak through Scripture as you're open to it and engage with Scripture. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank You for how You do speak to us and how You care for us and how You lead us and guide us. I pray that You would help us to be open to You whether we're reading huge chunks of the Bible or just one little verse, I ask that you would help us to see what you want us to know as we read and be changed by the Scriptures. I thank you for this, and I ask you to bless our day today. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.